Let's open our Bibles this evening, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Having started a new year this past Monday, I have now begun my 36th year of reading through the Bible over the course of the year, which brings me back to the opening chapters of the Old and New Testaments. And in doing so, as one reads through the Bible, he often runs across a difficult verse that he finds troublesome, either because uh, he doesn't understand it, it doesn't seem to make sense, perhaps. It seems to state what he thinks to be an impossibility, or seems perhaps contradictory with other passages. Bible skeptics, as we know, have their lists of uh, such verses that they point out to try to say the Bible is full of errors, mistakes, or contradictions, when there are, in fact, no contradictions and no errors in the Bible. We run across one such verse here in the fourth chapter of Genesis. In the aftermath of Cain's great crime in murdering his brother Abel. I've, of course, preached uh, several messages from these very important early chapters of Genesis, which we teach must be taken literally, word for word, and are not to be spiritualized, parabolized, or explained away as mythical fairy tales. And that includes, of course, the literal seven days of creation, the method by which God created man in his own image, and then made the woman for the man, literally taking Eve out of one of Adam's ribs, from his taken from his side. And that includes the worldwide flood of Noah. And it also includes a precise timeline uh, given in Genesis chapter 5, meaning we believe that the earth and the observable universe is far younger than what is taught by the false prophets, priests, and priestesses, of the godless religion of evolution. I reviewed those points again recently in a message last July, titled UFOs, ETs, and Geocentricity. So with that introduction, coming down to Genesis chapter 4, we read beginning in verse 1. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass. By the way, we are not told how much time had passed. We're not told how old these two sons are at this time, or how many other sons and daughters Adam and Eve may have had in the meantime. We're not told, told any of that. All we're told is that in process of time, it came to pass. That Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thou thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Meaning he has to rule over sin, temptation to sin. God is there personifying sin itself. First, although this is not my main reason for bringing into this chapter, to some this passage may seem to present a contradiction of the principle we read elsewhere, that God is not a respecter of persons. But of course there is no uh, contradiction here. Uh, God is not respecting Abel more than Cain just because of his person. To review some points covered before from this text, we know for certain that the reason we read in verses 4 to 5 that the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, is because the Lord had previously given instructions for proper offering and sacrifice. Abel, we know, obeyed those instructions, but Cain did not. And so the Lord had good reason for rejecting Cain's offering. First of all, just the fact that Cain and Abel brought an offering together at the same time and to the same place, in and of itself indicates that God had called for such offerings to be made at a particular time and place. Secondly, the Lord's response to Cain in verse 7 tells us that Cain was acting in disobedience. When the Lord said, if thou doest well, in effect meaning if you obey me, Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, if you disobey me, sin lieth at the door. Unto thee shall be his desire, 
and thou shalt rule over him. In that last statement, again, the Lord, in effect, personifies sin itself. And he says, your sin wants to control you, Cain, but you have to control your desire to sin instead. Cain had already sinned here in bringing an improper sacrifice. But now he was in great danger of committing a much worse sin for which he would suffer very devastating consequences. Sin always wants to control each of us. That's what the Lord's saying to Cain. Sin has an addictive effect and makes us its servants or slaves. That's why Jesus said in John 8:34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant or the slave of sin. And another reason we know that the Lord had given instructions previously for proper sacrifice, but that Cain disobeyed, is because we read in the New Testament in Hebrews 11, verse 4, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet speaketh. Abel brought his sacrifice by faith, meaning by believing God's revealed word. He came by faith. He believed God's word about sacrifice. The Bible does not tell us when that word regarding proper sacrifice was revealed. But I believe it was revealed in chapter 3, after Adam and Eve fell into sin. In verse 15, Genesis 3.15, we read the first prophecy of the coming virgin-born Messiah, the seed of a woman. By the way, that's the only verse in the Bible that mentions a woman having seed. Speaking of the virgin-born Messiah, who would crush the head of the serpent while having his own heel crushed, meaning that he would bring ultimate victory in defeating Satan, for which he would have to shed his blood to do that. Then in verse 21 of that chapter, in chapter 3, we see that although the Lord had told Adam in the day that he ate of that fruit, he would surely die. On that day, instead, the Lord killed an innocent animal as a substitute, shedding its blood in order to make coats of skins for Adam and Eve. And I believe that is when the Lord gave the instruction for proper sin sacrifice going forward. And those sacrifices would then point as, as an offering of faith in that coming Messiah. And that established the timeless principle that is still true today, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Abel obeyed those instructions and brought a blood sacrifice. Cain rejected those instructions, I guess because he thought he had a better idea. Instead of a blood sacrifice, he brought an offering that he had produced by his own labor, by his hard work, the fruit of the ground, that being the fruit of his labor. And he probably brought the best that he had to offer of that fruit of the ground, of that you know, fruit of his labor. But bringing his own works before the Lord rather than the blood sacrifice is really the basis for all false religion in this world. Every one of which is based on man's works and man's own effort, doing what he can do, either to appease or to please whatever God he believes in, or just to please himself and serve his own good pleasure. All such false religion began with Cain's attempt in this account to come to God by virtue of his own works. Which is why we read in Jude 11, that false teachers and false religionists have gone in what Jude calls the way of Cain, trying to come to God through the works of man, through their own works, rather than through the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. As Jade covered this past Sunday, Paul calls all such false teachers who try to come to God by works, evil workers. In Philippians chapter 3, they're evil workers. They've gone the way of Cain. So reading on then to Cain's greater sin and the terrible consequences that came of it, the main point in tonight's Bible study, verse 8 says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. It came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. When we read there that Cain talked with Abel, the meaning there is that they actually talked with each other. And it's quite uh, in fact, it's quite apparent that Abel, in fact, preached or he prophesied to Cain at that time. We can presume that because the Lord Jesus referred to Abel as a prophet when he rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 23 and also in Luke chapter 11, verse 49 to 51, where Jesus said to the Pharisees, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles 
some of them they shall slay and persecute. He said, verse 50, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. So there in that passage, 11, uh, Luke 11, 50, Jesus said Abel was a prophet. And so I would suggest that when this text says that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, I believe that means they had a very heated discussion in that Abel's prophesying to Cain is in all likelihood what precipitated being murdered by his brother Cain. He was murdered as a prophet. And the Lord said unto Cain, verse 9, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he, the Lord, said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Abel's blood cried out to the Lord for justice and for vengeance, for the Lord to avenge his death. Paul referred to this verse, by the way, in Hebrews 12, 22-24, when he said that those who are in Christ have not come to the fearful sight of Mount Sinai, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. To the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood cried out to the Lord for justice and vengeance under the law. But the blood of Jesus speaks of grace and mercy and redemption from sin. So God says, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. Cried out for vengeance. God let Cain live and didn't take vengeance on him as far as he didn't put him to death. But he still pronounced a very heavy sentence upon him here in verse 11 of Genesis 4. Now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. From thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And shall come to pass, everyone that findeth me shall slay me. The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. There have been all kinds of speculative, wild theories about what is meant here by the mark that the Lord set upon Cain, from some saying it was a horn or a literal mark or a letter on his forehead, to a wild and ghastly looking appearance, to one wild theory said it was an earthquake wherever Cain stepped. Uh, but the simple fact is that the Bible does not say what that mark was, and it may mean something just as simple as a figure of speech that Cain was a, a marked man as may have been known only to the Lord, not a visible mark, but that the Lord mercifully marked or singled out Cain from among other men with no more than a promise of divine protection against any who would bring him harm. It may just mean something as simple as that. Verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And then we read, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch. And he, built it, he, Cain, built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. First of all, to clarify, this is not the prophet Enoch mentioned in the New Testament in Jude, verse 14, the seventh from Adam, who Jude says prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That was a prophecy of Enoch there in Jude 14. We read about that Enoch 
in the next chapter, chapter 5, verses 19 through 24, where we are given the birth line of the promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who descended from Seth rather than from Cain. But back to my mention here of difficult Bible verses that skeptics like to point to in order to say that the Bible is full of errors and contradictions when there are, in fact, no contradictions and no errors in the Bible. One such verse they point to, and one that seems to raise the most questions from both skeptics and immature Christians, is right here in verse 17, where we read that, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. Of course, the question consistently raised is, if, as the Bible says, all mankind originated and descended from Adam and Eve, the first two human beings, then where on earth did Cain find a wife? To answer the question, we have to first state and we have to acknowledge unequivocally that all nations of the earth and every human being that ever lived do trace their ancestry back to Adam and Eve. The Bible says that repeatedly and consistently throughout. Every ancestry lineage in the Bible traces its origin back to Adam. In the preceding chapter we read in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 20, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. In Acts 17, we find Paul preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, where Paul said in uh, Acts 17, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither does worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed the bounds of their habitation. That means they, in making them all of one blood, they all descended from one father. Is what that means. Romans 5, we read, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all sin. Adam was that one man who brought sin into the world, and he passed that sin nature on to all of his offspring. So all men now are sinners, and all men there are then are subject to death. Again, Romans 5, continuing in verse 15. For if through the offense of one, through Adam's sin, many be made dead. Through Adam's sin, the entire human race was cursed to death because all that, the entire human race sprang from Adam. Much more the grace of God than the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus, hath abounded unto many. So Romans 5, 12 to 15 pretty much says that all Humanity sprang from Adam's loins. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul repeats the same concept where he says in verse 21, For since by man, that by Adam, came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, because we are all descended from Adam. So in Christ shall all be made alive. So, uh, first of all, all nations of the earth, every human being that ever lived, trace their ancestry back to Adam and Eve. And by the way, I'd also add that God did not make a new wife for Cain like he did for Adam, because if he did, Paul could not have said in Acts 17 that all nations of men descended from one blood. And so, where on earth did Cain find a wife? Knowing from Genesis 5, 3 to 5, that after Eve bore Adam's third son, Seth, they also had many other sons and daughters as well. That was after Cain killed Abel. That was after Eve bore Adam's third son, Seth. And they also had many other sons and daughters. The very simple answer and the only possible explanation to this question is that Cain took a near relative, either his sister or his niece, a daughter of one of his other siblings, as his wife. Which from the time of the law of Moses was given on Mount Sinai to the present day has been both forbidden, illegal, and genetically dangerous. And for most in our modern culture today, the concept is unthinkable or abominable. But for several reasons we have to bear in mind, that was not at all true from the time of creation until actually quite some time after the flood of Noah. The law of Moses was not given until 2,700 years after creation. And while we read in Leviticus 18 and 20 that Israelite men were forbidden under the law of Moses from marrying or from laying carnally with their sisters, there were no such prohibitions before that time. That's, by the way, also true of several other things, such as dietary laws. Israelites were forbidden from eating certain animals declared at the time of the giving of the law to be unclean. But before that time, 
after the flood waters receded and Noah and his family came off the ark, they were told in Genesis 9.3, quote, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as a green herb have I given you now all things. Prior to the law of Moses, there was no prohibition against brothers marrying sisters. We need to remember also, by the way, that Noah's grandchildren, the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their sons, would have faced the exact same problem as Cain. Who were they going to marry? And in order uh, to obey God's command to be fruitful and multiply, they too would have had to marry their near relatives also, either cousins, sisters, or nieces. We read in Genesis chapter 20 that Abraham married his half-sister. First he told Abimelech in verse 2 of Genesis 20 that Sarah was his sister. Then when Abimelech found out she was his wife, Abraham then said in verse 12, And yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So he married his half-sister. We read in Genesis 24 that Abraham's son Isaac married Rebekah, who was the daughter of his cousin Bethuel. And then Isaac's son Jacob married his two cousins, Leah and Rachel. So clearly the Bible did not forbid the marriage of close relatives until the time of Moses. We also need to remember that prior to the flood, things were much different. Atmospheric conditions were different than they are now. Before the flood, the earth was like a giant greenhouse with a vapor canopy surrounding the planet that you know, collapsed at the time of the flood. But there was much higher atmospheric pressure uh, on the earth before the flood. Bloodlines were pure back then with no cumulative genetic anomalies or defects that are present today. So there was far less danger of genetic mutations in the antediluvian times before the flood than is true today. All of which contributed to the fact that before the flood of Noah, men lived much longer lives than has been true since, we know. Adam lived to be 930 years old, and except for Enoch, seventh from Adam, who walked with God and therefore was taken up to heaven, at a very young age of 365 years, the average lifespan of Adam's descendants in Genesis chapter 5, all the way from Adam to Noah's father Lamech, the average lifespan was 907 and a half years. And may I say that in, in living such long lifespans back then, each of those fathers of every generation could have potentially sired hundreds of children. Think about that for a, for a minute. Even if every family only had 20 sons and 20 daughters, they could have had a lot more. But even if they only had 20 sons and 20 daughters, simple math tells us that in eight generations, there could have, there were probably at least 2 billion, billion with a B, people on the face of the earth at the time of the flood of Noah. We have no idea how long Cain wandered as a vagabond in the earth before finding a wife. But within just a few short decades, there would have been many, many eligible females for him to choose a wife from. No problem. Adam and Eve, we know, were perfect when God created them. They pronounced everything to be very good. They had perfect bloodlines. They had perfect genes. But then when sin entered the world, the human species began to suffer, of course, the degenerative effects of sin. So that by the time the law was given, the cumulative effects of such degeneration then made it necessary to forbid brothers and sisters from intermarrying in order, of course, to avoid genetic mutations birth defects, deformities in children. Cain, however, had no such problem, either physically, legally, or morally. And it was not only perfectly acceptable in that day for Cain to marry a close relative, either a sister or a niece, but it was in fact expected and required of him in order to obey God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Just as it was also for many others in that culture, and for several generations after Cain, even until some time after the flood of Noah. Again, Noah's grandsons, the sons of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, had to marry either sisters or cousins. So there is the answer, very simple and, and straightforward, to the question of where did Cain find a wife? And so the modern skeptic who points to this issue in an attempt to support his view that the Bible cannot be taken literally or seriously instead needs to see how utterly ironic it is for him to do so when, in fact, 
the notion of Cain marrying his sister or niece makes infinitely more common sense than does that same skeptic's foolish and most unscientific faith in his religion of evolution that actually relies on genetic mutation of the species and life evolving from lifeless rocks and man evolving from chimpanzees over billions of years. And that, by the way, when we know that true science points ever so clearly to a relatively young universe and solar system that cannot be more than 10,000 years old, making evolution entirely impossible, as we've shown in those other messages mentioned earlier. So that's what I had for you tonight. That was a quick Bible study here about how did Cain find a wife, and that's all I had for you tonight. So at that point in time, I am going to open the floor for any discussion, questions, and answers.